blazing fires, raging adrenaline, and total anarchy, all within the walls of a federal prison. FBI tactical teams and negotiators work around the clock, trying to avoid a small-scale war and keep nearly 100 hostages alive. In the 1980s, the federal penitentiary in Atlanta housed some of the country's most notorious prisoners. 1,800 Cubans fleeing Castro's regime. 400 were hardened criminals. 200 were insane. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Castro called them undesirables. The U.S. government called them detainees. In 1987, they staged a bloody revolt. Now, the FBI and special operations teams must infiltrate a burning prison to stop the violence before it rages out of control. Cuba, 1980. A plummeting economy and political unrest prompt Fidel Castro to allow Cuban citizens to leave the country. For the first time in history, the notorious dictator permits American boats to enter Cuba's Mariel Harbor. In a five-month period, over 120,000 undocumented refugees flee the country, heading for Florida. 2,700 are considered criminals or mentally ill under U.S. law. The Attorney General instructs the Bureau of Prisons to find space for them in America's already overcrowded prison system. 1,000 Cuban refugees are sent to the Federal Detention Center in Oakdale, Louisiana. Nearly 1,400 are transported to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. For seven years, the U.S. and Cuban governments negotiate to send the criminals and mentally ill refugees back to Cuba. On November 20, 1987, the State Department strikes a treaty with Cuba. Over 2,700 Cuban detainees will be sent back. Within 24 hours, Cuban detainees in both prisons get news of the decision. In Oakdale, Louisiana, a thousand of them riot, taking 28 prison guards hostage. But at the Atlanta Penitentiary, all is quiet. Warden Joe Petrovsky, but there was a trust between the detainees and the correctional officers, and that trust was basically the treatment that the detainees got from the correctional officers. Early Monday morning, three days after the treaty is signed, prison employee Ted Manier arrives at work. He notices an eerie silence. There were hardly any inmates in the breakfast area. And normally it would be uh, full of inmates who were making a lot of noise and talking, and there was hardly anybody in there, so it was really quiet, unusually quiet. On the first floor of the prison industries building, detainees make mattresses. On the surface, it looks like business as usual. But in an instant, detainees overpower their guards and ignite fires. On the third floor of the industry's building, Manir and his supervisor oversee a furniture making shop. The riot spreads to the rest of the floors. It sounded like a roar, and it was coming up the stairwell. They 
got the door down. And they just came running in. And they had these hoods over their head. Like they were made out of gray t-shirts or gray sweatshirts. And they just had holes poked out for their eyes so they could see. Lanier tries to report the emergency, but he is attacked by one of the rioters. And I don't know if he was trying to hit me or just the telephone out of my hand. But he knocked the phone out of my hand that went across the room. Prison employees are facing their worst nightmare. Although they are well aware of the risks, they never thought it would happen to them. But we did realize there was a threat, but I guess you think you can control it. When you work with inmates, you get used to them, and sometimes you forget who they really are. The guards and factory workers are helpless. Unarmed and outnumbered, they face rioters carrying homemade weapons. The staff member notifies Warden Petrovsky of the crisis. Inside the wall, nobody carried weapons. The inmates always vastly outnumbered the staff. So if we had weapons in there, we could lose those weapons. The only weapons that we had was weapons in the tower. Petrovsky alerts the FBI and the prison's regional director. I try to give him an assessment of exactly what transpired and brought him up to date. As fire spreads throughout the industry's building, the detainees force the guards and employees into a tool cage and lock the door. We kind of thought that unless there was some miracle, that we would probably just burn up because there was no way to get out of one of the cages. The riot spreads throughout the entire penitentiary complex. Enraged detainees capture guards, taking keys as they take hostages. They begin to release the regular prison population from their cells. The riot is beyond containment. The detainees now control most of the central buildings. Rioters attempt to gain access to the main cell block, but guards lock down the sally port just in time. As flames and smoke engulf the massive prison complex, nearly 100 guards and employees are trapped inside. Built at the turn of the century, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary is the largest penitentiary in the United States. It was a fortress inside that was surrounded by a wall. It raised from the ground approximately 40 feet, and the width on the top of the wall was approximately three uh, yards wide. So it was a massive, massive wall. The penitentiary is built on 300 acres of land with 28 acres of property inside the walls. Okay, well we've got guards. Warden Petrovsky needs to figure out exactly where his people are located inside the complex. We had staff members in 11 towers that had very good observation over the entire outside compound who logged those employees that they recognized in those areas. We started a list of the officers that we thought were hostages. Ted Manier and his colleagues are trapped inside an equipment cage in the Burning Industries building. Several rioters try to convince the Cuban detainees guarding the cage to unlock the door. They were trying to uh, talk the guard into opening the door because they wanted to get us out and kill us or do whatever. So the guard had to tell them that they couldn't open the door and occasionally they would push one off or get in a little rassle. But the raging fire threatens to destroy the building. So the rioters are forced to move their hostages to another part of the prison complex. The 
The only route takes them across the yard in clear view of the towers. A tower guard spots what he believes are detainees threatening prison employees. There was a guy that was up ahead of me and he got hit. I, I remember seeing him. He was a Cuban, he got hit right behind the ear. One of the hostage takers is killed and five others are wounded. I was getting worried because the bullets were going pretty close around where we were. Chaos reigns as guards and detainees run for cover. They ran us across to the corner of the building where they couldn't shoot at us. And that time they took us in the chapel. Detainees forced their hostages into a small room and locked them inside. Less than an hour after the riots begin, FBI agents from the Atlanta field office arrive at the penitentiary. The FBI has jurisdiction over criminal matters in all federal prisons. Warden Petrovsky briefs Weldon Kennedy, the special agent in charge. The first thing that I wanted to accomplish was to find out how many hostages had been taken, uh, how many might be injured, uh, what was the threat to those people who were, in fact, taken hostage. All of these people were like on an emotional high. I mean, they'd been prisoners for literally eight, ten years, uh, some of them serving life sentences, and now they're free to roam around the prison. It was like a holiday. This is the area where they... Agent Leon Blakeney heads the Atlanta FBI SWAT team. <laughs> Agent Blakeney appears in silhouette to protect his identity. Nobody really knew what area that the, uh, that the inmates controlled. And they really didn't know how many hostages were taken. You had 2,500 people housed in that institution. There were people running around uh, all over the place, and, and quite frankly, it was chaos. Chaos that had already turned deadly. As agents Kennedy and Blakeney develop their plan to retake the prison, they receive critical intelligence from two sources. From FBI agents posted outside the walls of the prison complex, and from prisoners inside the walls who don't want any part of the riot. We began to learn uh, who the hostages might be, where the detainees were holding up, uh, how many were there, uh, what kind of weapons they might have. The detainees have taken the guards' radios, compromising prison communications. Agents and guards switch to a secure frequency. Two white males and two black males. The situation is grim. Negotiations will be critical to resolving the standoff. Special Agent D. Rosario, an FBI negotiator, opens up a dialogue with the rioters. Unreasonable demands are being made. The hostage takers want things done now. And that's why it is so important to try to bring them down to a level where they can be reasonable. Can you negotiate with people at that very high emotional level? Generally speaking, no. So we had to give it time. The rioters are emotionally charged, angry over the shooting death of a detainee. This theme came up time and again. You killed one of ours. You had no reason to, and you killed him. And they wanted me to see the bodies, so I had the body brought out to where we were. I looked at the body. They wanted me to get emotionally involved with them. And these four that originally came out to talk to me really were only speaking for themselves. They were not speaking on behalf of the 1,400 that were in there. In the command post, Warden Petrovsky receives a frantic call from 16 employees who have barricaded themselves in cell block E. E block is home to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary's most dangerous criminals. 
these particular group of inmates were locked away and he to keep them from harming someone. If the detainees get into cell block E and free the inmates, the lives of all 16 employees will be in danger. The E cell block is also home to the prison system's most notorious inmate, Thomas Silverstein. A number of people in the Bureau of Prisons told me that he singularly was the toughest prisoner they believed that the Bureau of Prisons had ever housed or had in their custody. He was just an absolute uh, animal. And he hated everything to do with uh, the Bureau of Prisons or any of their staff. Silverstein was incarcerated in 1975 for a bank robbery. Years later, he was sentenced to multiple life terms for fatally stabbing an inmate and a prison guard. Thomas Silverstein was cold and he was a killer. He had two things on his mind to escape from jail because his crimes were such where he was going to die in jail. Uh, and, and the other objective was to kill people. Uh, it was as simple as that. The guards in cell block E are in grave danger. Special Agent Kennedy works with the FBI SWAT team to come up with a plan to rescue them. The SWAT analysis was that they believed that they could go over the wall out of view of the rioting detainees and retrieve those people out of that building successfully. The SWAT team will need ladders to get over the 40-foot high wall. Special Agent Blakeney calls on the Atlanta Fire Department and a National Guard helicopter crew to help carry out the plan. We put a helicopter up uh, on the opposite side of the prison to attract their attention and uh, at least have some diversion. Hey, Chief, here's the situation. We've got a hostage crisis. Seven hours after the riot began, the FBI SWAT team launches a daring mission to rescue 16 prison employees without endangering the lives of nearly 100 hostages. Seven hours after a riot breaks out at Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, an FBI SWAT team launches a mission to rescue 16 employees barricaded in one of the prison cell blocks. FBI Special Agent Weldon Kennedy knows that if the rescue attempt is seen by rioting Cuban detainees, it could spell disaster. They would not hesitate to kill hostages if it became apparent to them that we were going to try to retake the prison or retake any part of it. After scaling the wall, the FBI SWAT team approaches cell block E, home to the prison's most dangerous inmates. SWAT rushes the prison employees out of the building. Keep your head down. Identify yourself when you get down there. Across the prison yard, 27 employees, afraid for their safety, have barricaded themselves inside the prison hospital. Frustrated, they watch as their colleagues are escorted to safety. FBI SWAT team leader Leon Blakeney. You know, they're screaming, frantic, you know, come and get us, come and get us. The director of the Bureau of Prisons urges the FBI SWAT team to go back for the hospital employees. The SWAT personnel informed me that there was a 100% probability that they would be detected going over the wall to try to effect a rescue of the hospital people. We can't protect the other hostages that are being held in other parts of the prison. And my concern was if, if in fact, we were observed then uh, they would start killing the other employees. Blakeney wants to rescue the hospital staff, but knows it's a risk he cannot afford. The detainees break into cell block E and release the inmates. Vicious criminals run free including Thomas Silverstein, a ruthless killer.
As darkness falls, three buildings have been consumed by fire. Nearly 100 guards and employees have been taken hostage or have barricaded themselves inside the prison. Prison employee Ted Manier is being held inside a room in the prison's chapel. So a man came up to the window, and he wasn't a Cuban. And the guy beside me said, that's Silverstein. And he came inside, and he had a flashlight, and he started shining his flashlight. He shined the light on me, he said, don't I know you? And I told him, no. I said, I don't, I've never seen you before. And he said, you don't know who I am? He looked worse than anything I've ever seen in any type of movie or anything. And when you look at him, you'd know he isn't a normal. <laughs> There's something, something strange about him. Uh, he's really scared. Detainees finally distract Silverstein and he leaves without harming the hostages. On day two of the standoff, FBI tactical commander Danny Colson arrives at the prison. You could hear this huge roar. It was like a million bumblebees. You could almost feel the energy of those rioting prisoners. Colson started the FBI's hostage rescue team, an elite counterterrorism group in 1982. The HRT is law enforcement's equivalent to the Navy SEALs of the Army's Delta Force. The only unit in the United States that has a sophisticated explosive or thermal breaching capability is the FBI's hostage rescue team. But the HRT is already tied up handling the riot at Oakdale. So I was going to a, a very difficult tactical assignment without the team I was used to commanding. Despite not having the hostage rescue team available to him, Colson must still develop a full-scale tactical rescue plan. He faces several obstacles. A prison is built to keep bad guys in. You have barred doors, you have steel gates. Well, these same type of things keep a rescue force from getting in. I needed help from the military, primarily from the Delta Force. Delta Force is the Army's special operations unit, but using them at the prison would be illegal. A posse comitatus law was passed right after the Civil War, and that law prevents the military from being involved actively with their personnel in civil law enforcement. Barring approval from the White House, the FBI must rely solely on civilian law enforcement. Weldon Kennedy assembles over 400 SWAT members at the prison. We had SWAT teams from all around the country, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, as well as, of course, the immediate uh, surrounding area. We figured that based on the capability we had, we were probably maybe an hour away from getting in to rescue the hostages. We were all concerned that, that, that they started killing hostages. We, we were helpless to get in there. And that's one of the reasons that, that D. Rosario and the other negotiators were working so hard to try to get somebody to talk to to calm the situation down. But the negotiations are not going well. None of the rioters D. Rosario has spoken with has enough power to influence the detainees. The negotiators need a different approach. We could be here for a very long time unless we come up with a group of people in there among the detainees that can speak basically for, if not all of them, for the majority. Rosario asks prison employees which detainees command the most respect. Files of these people were opened to us, and we looked at several of them, and we decided on five or six men. We went to the grading and called them by name. And they came to the grading. And we invited them to come over to our side 
and sit down at a table with us and talk with us. The detainees agree to talk with negotiators. And we began our first serious conversations in terms of how can we resolve this? What is it that you're looking for? The number one demand that they had was that ultimately the Immigration and Naturalization Service conduct individual hearings for each and every one of them to remain in the United States. It's a straightforward request. Rosario agrees to pass it on to the Department of Justice. As the meeting ends, the negotiator uses a bit of psychology to help solidify the group's standing as leaders within the prison. We uh, decided to give these men the mail that had accumulated since before the riot began. In the penitentiary, daily mail is an important link to the outside world. They went back in there, and we could literally hear the shouting of glee uh, when these guys showed up with two bags full of mail. We believe it created in the minds of the others that these guys could get things done for them. And that's where it began. After that, we kept asking for the same men. Rosario is beginning to make progress, but negotiations go slowly. In the prison hospital, 27 trapped employees are out of time. Detainees are trying to break down the door of the hospital with a battering ram. The employees call Warden Petrovsky in the command center. Warden Petrovsky relays the information to Weldon Kennedy. Detainees could break through the hospital doors at any moment. We had 27 people in there, and there was concern that once the hospital was taken over, they might be injured or even killed. So the ram is going, we can hear it as a matter of fact, banging the metal doors of the prison. Bureau of Prison officials worry about what could happen if detainees get access to the drugs and narcotics stored in the hospital. Um, what about right here? Weldon Kennedy asks HRT Commander Danny Colson for a second assessment. I said, yeah, we can get him out. We can go over the wall. We can defend the area with the perimeter and slot him out over the walls, and we're out of there. Colson's biggest concern is that the detainees are watching news coverage of the riots. Inmates were watching TV to see what we were doing as much as they could. And they could very well believe that a rescue of the entire prison was underway. And then they could start executing the hostages. Hospital workers are moments away from becoming hostages or worse. So here we have a huge dilemma. Do we go in and take those people out of the hospital and save them? Or do we let them be taken hostage? Kennedy decides a rescue is too risky. My decision was, based on all the information that I had, we will not go for the rescue. I will not authorize the rescue. And when he went back in and announced it to the Bureau of Prisons, I remember one Bureau of Prisons official storming past me and looking at me and said, if those are FBI agents, you'd go get them. And I said, no, he wouldn't. Weldon Kennedy wonders if he has just signed a death warrant for 27 innocent people. For two days, a riot rages at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Dozens of Cuban detainees now control the prison. 27 Bureau of Prison employees are trapped in the prison hospital. Weldon Kennedy, special agent in charge of the FBI's Atlanta field office, makes a tough decision. If we entered the penitentiary, if we tried to retake it, there was a threat they were going to immediately kill them all. Kennedy decides not to launch a rescue mission. Two hours after the decision, communication is lost with the employees in the prison hospital. 
It's the warden. Pick up if you hear me. I knew that if anything happened to any one of those 27 people, that I would forever live with that uh, as being the person responsible. Guards stationed at the prison towers gather intelligence as detainees move hostages across the prison yard. One guard calls the FBI command post with a disturbing development. A group of detainees is dragging acetylene tanks into a basement where they can access the prison's utility tunnels. Danny Colson is the FBI's tactical commander at the scene. They might be able to bring those tanks to get enough of them underneath our command post where the tunnels ran and uh, cause an explosion which would have decimated the command post and maybe have allowed them to escape. Colson and the FBI SWAT team prepare to go down into the tunnels. The tunnels were, were designed for two purposes. One is that all the utilities went through the tunnels, the steam pipes, the electrical pipes, and they were big tunnels. There were also ventilation tunnels that uh, started uh, big enough for a man to walk in standing up and ended up uh, only a few inches uh, uh, high. Colson and SWAT team leader Leon Blakeney have no idea what they will encounter once they are inside. Prison maps aren't reliable, and communication with agents above ground is not possible. As the team makes their way through the underground maze of pipes, they encounter a group of detainees. Leon Blakeney. Once we got in the tunnels, we discovered then that, that in fact the Cubans were in there. And oftentimes we'd come in very close proximity to them, uh, within 10 feet of them. There would be a bunch of them and we'd confront them. And fortunately, uh, every time they'd turn around and run. The SWAT team is unable to find the acetylene tanks in the vast underground system. But they are convinced the detainees are exploring the tunnels for a possible escape route. We decided that the tunnel system was, was a real threat to the successful uh, resolution of, of the crisis. Ultimately, we were able to, to station uh, SWAT teams down there. The Chicago SWAT team handled one part of the tunnel system, and the Washington Field Office SWAT team handled another uh, part of the tunnel system. On day three of the standoff, Danny Colson receives intelligence from agents with high-powered binoculars positioned around the prison. The detainees have moved nearly all the hostages to a building known as the American Dorm. Colson begins to formulate a tactical rescue plan. What do you think they mean? What, what can they... Outside the prison, crowds gather. Families of the hostages, the prison guards, and even the detainees wait for information about their loved ones. The media covers breaking news from the penitentiary. There was hundreds of media people there. There were networks, there was local TV. They established a tent city right across the street from the, from the prison. A single reporter and a simple error threatened to bring the standoff to a violent end. Special Agent D. Rosario. The New York SWAT team was coming off shift and the Chicago SWAT team was coming on shift and they passed each other right at the steps of the administration building. And it looked impressive because there was two very large groups of armed men, all dressed in black. Local reporter in Atlanta uh, is watching this and sees these 40 or 50 men dressed in SWAT gear going up the front steps and jumps to the conclusion and says so on live TV that, well, there they go. Looks like the FBI is going to retake control of the prison. When the detainees see the media report, they take immediate action. They brought several hostages out to the yard. And for the benefit of, of our cameras so we could see them, they brought these hostages out and they poured gasoline over them. And then they took their cigarette lighters and began clicking whilst literally screaming at us, if you want to assault us, go ahead. As soon as you do, we're setting fire to these men. Without knowing it, a young journalist may have just made a mistake that could cost the lives of nearly a hundred innocent people.
At the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI agents negotiate with Cuban detainees who have taken over the prison. The lives of nearly 100 hostages hang in the balance. On day three of the standoff, a journalist's error ignites a crisis. FBI tactical commander Danny Colson. All along our negotiators have been telling the, the Cubans that, that we weren't coming in, and that we wanted to negotiate and wanted them to surrender. And now a reporter is saying we're coming in. The erroneous media report makes Special Agent D. Rosario's job even tougher as he negotiates for the lives of the hostages. We had brought them down to such a, a reasonable level of emotion, and when they thought that the FBI was about to assault, they literally lost it. We came literally within a few heartbeats of losing the hostages right then and there. We sent everybody to what we call phase line green, which is the last position you are in before you do a rescue. It was like a spark that was uh, about to uh, ignite this terrible inferno of, of, uh, of energy we had built up there. I had to convince them that no such assault was going to take place. And that, you know, if, if things were going so well and so positive, why wouldn't we even think about assaulting them? After three tense hours, the rioters agree to continue negotiations and spare the hostages. We're just lucky that our negotiators were able to calm them down and we didn't have any loss of life. For Colson, the close call is a warning sign that the standoff could explode into a full-scale riot with very little provocation. At the end of day three, he obtains presidential approval to deploy Delta Force in a civilian crisis. The special operations team arrives in Atlanta disguised as FBI agents. There were three things that I desperately needed from them. The first was their breaching capability. They had all the breaching capability that would be necessary to get back into that prison to do a dynamic rescue. They had the ability to use explosives to blow steel gores down or blow locks out. They had the ability to use thermal devices to cut in an instant through steel and cable. The second thing I wanted was their sniper capability. When we went into that prison, if we had to go in, I wanted the very best snipers I could find doing cover for my men as they went in. The other thing is they have tremendous medical capability. They travel with a complete hospital. Uh, they set up with the doctors, nurses, uh, uh, emergency equipment, uh, the latest state-of-the-art everything. If Delta Force or FBI teams engage the detainees in combat, the military hospital is prepared to treat any injury. They can bring their doctors right in with us. They can pop a chest and do open heart surgery right there in the premises if necessary. For the next several days, Delta Force snipers keep the detainees under constant surveillance. The rioters are working 24 hours a day, making weapons by the thousands. There's all kinds of steel inside the, uh, the prison, and they're very resourceful with the equipment, the ground weapons and the spears. Each one of them must have had at least two weapons. Delta Force sets up surveillance cameras all over the complex to track the movement of the detainees. Agents look for ways to get closer to the areas where the hostages are being held. The Cuban detainees decide to kill the hostages. The tactical team must be able to launch an assault on a moment's notice. We've got uh, two people guarding the American dorm. This is not something where you play a video game and after it's over, you hit your reset button and everybody's alive again. You're talking about the lives of human beings here, and you have a tremendous responsibility to try to get those people out. Colson and Blakeney go back into the tunnels underneath the prison. One of the tunnels leads to the prison's electrical room. It's located right outside the American dorm where most of the hostages are held. We were literally uh, on the other side of the window from inmates that were uh, right, across, right across the walkway from where the hostages were being held. 
by doing that, we moved our response time from half an hour to 10 seconds. It was a tremendous, a tremendous leap in our capability at that point. With the FBI SWAT teams and Delta Force in place, they will be in a better position to protect the hostages if negotiations break down. Until they start harming a hostage, there's no reason for us to try to gain forcible entry to save these people. We therefore will wait as long as it takes. The rioters have enough food to survive for up to a year. The day after Thanksgiving, they erect a Christmas tree on the roof of the building. That was very disheartening to us. Maybe they didn't intend it psychologically to be that way. We interpret it as we are going to be here through Christmas. On day eight of the crisis, prison guards stationed in the tunnel hear the sound of a drill. One guard recognizes the voice of Thomas Silverstein, the most vicious inmate in the federal prison system. They think Silverstein is searching for a way out. We knew he would absolutely kill a hostage if it, if he, if it would help him escape. Weldon Kennedy asks Danny Colson to go back into the tunnels to apprehend Silverstein. So we walked down the tunnel and, and we did a tactical formation going down the tunnel and we had lights on our weapons. Suddenly we noticed there was water on the floor and then the water started getting deeper and it was over the tops of our shoes and then over our ankles and up to our knees. And what we finally realized is that that tunnel was actually flooded. The water flooding the tunnels had been dumped by National Guard helicopters to fight the fires. Looking further into the tunnel, he can see water fills it to the ceiling. He knows there is no way Thomas Silverstein can be in there. And what they were hearing was there were, there were tubes, ventilation tubes, that were above the water line. So the guards were actually hearing his voice, but we knew he wasn't going to get out. Still, Colson knows that Silverstein is as dangerous inside the prison as he is on the outside. He was a sociopath, and he'd already he'd proven he would commit murder. So had he done that, had he attempted to, to harm a guard or, or anybody else in there, uh, it would have caused us to have to go in and launch a rescue we didn't want to have to launch. And then again, we were faced with significant loss of life. Knowing Thomas Silverstein is such a dangerous wild card, FBI negotiator D. Rosario must convince the detainees to turn him over. United States, OK? I emphasized and kept re-emphasizing the fact that uh, Tommy Silverstein could become a very grave liability to the Cuban detainees and to their cause and to what they were trying to attain. I was told that uh, they would think about it. Rosario tells the rioters that until Silverstein is back behind bars, the hostages are in grave danger. As long as the vicious killer roams free, the standoff could come to a sudden and violent end. More than a week into the intense standoff with Cuban detainees at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, FBI negotiators worry that a dangerous American prisoner could jeopardize a peaceful end to the conflict. What I suggested to them was that at some point or another, it would be in your best interest to turn Tommy Silverstein over to us. Special Agent D. Rosario tries to convince the rioters that Silverstein is a serious threat to prison employees who are being held hostage. The American inmate is jeopardizing their position in the negotiations. A short time later, a large group of detainees appears at the sally port gate of the main cell block. And there was about 100 Cubans screaming, waving their sabers in the air. And I could see they had Silverstein. And in the midst of all these screaming Cubans, they threw, literally threw Silverstein at us. 
Detainees tell agents how they captured Silverstein. So they gained access to the pharmacy. They took some narcotic. They put it in a can of a fruit cocktail, which he was known to like, and fed him fruit cocktail laced liberally with this drug, which in effect knocked him out. The FBI viewed Silverstein's capture as an act of good faith. That told us a lot. They don't want to hurt the hostages. It showed the negotiators that these Cubans were responsible. They were willing to do things to cooperate with us in order to reach a common goal, which is a, a great step in any negotiation process. On December 1st, a separate riot at Louisiana's Oakdale Penitentiary is resolved. The Cuban detainees incarcerated at Oakdale agree to release their hostages if the INS will review their cases. The government of the United States, through the voice of the Attorney General, told them, you know, it's not unreasonable to give you a hearing. D. Rosario offers the Atlanta detainees the same deal. Hostage takers have gotten exactly what they want, but still, negotiations stall. Audio surveillance reveals the rioters think the FBI will not use deadly force to remove them from the prison, that they would have a fighting chance to overpower federal forces. The Cubans thought that the FBI and uh, the other assets would come in with nightsticks and batons and just duke it out. The next day, Colson decides to send the hostage takers an indelible message. The detainee agrees to talk with Colson. And he said, I need to go to the restroom. So I said, wait right here. So I went around the barrier and I got the uh, Marshall's SOG team and the New York City SWAT team. I, I got them all up and I said, put on all your gear and line up along the walls and look mean. And he walked around that barricade and when he walked down that corridor, he literally jumped off the ground. And I said, this is not going to be a, a nightstick duel with your swords. We're going to use deadly force. The rioters agree to the terms of the surrender. On day 12 of the standoff, the Cuban detainees release their hostages. I will never, ever forget those guys coming through that sally port and walking right by me and, and the look of relief. They were haggard and they were tired and they were worn out with this great sense of relief and they're all smiling ear to ear. When we finally walked out with hostages, not one of them having been harmed in any way. We regarded that as a huge success. After 12 intense days, the Atlanta prison riot is over. One of the most important things that sort of focused the American public on the plight of the Cubans. And um, I think that was important. They did have a story to tell. They just told it in the wrong way. After the riots, all detainees are granted an INS hearing. Some are released. Others with criminal records or mental disabilities are repatriated back to Cuba. The rest remain in prison. In Detroit, a brutal gang strikes again and again, targeting residents in terrifying home invasions. They attack quickly, take what they want, and leave no evidence behind. As the assaults continue, the FBI and local police join forces to stop the terror. In the end, authorities come face to face with a vicious gang that refuses to be taken alive.
1990s, neighborhoods in Detroit were terrorized by a gang of robbers. Impersonating police officers, they invaded over 100 homes, robbing, raping, and torturing their victims. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The extraordinary number and sheer magnitude of these home invasions stunned authorities. As residents feared for their lives, agents teamed up with local police to take down this sadistic gang. Detroit, Michigan, February 1994. In some neighborhoods, narcotics trafficking is a way of life, and drug busts by the local police are routine. This raid is anything but routine. <laughs> The men ask the resident where he keeps his drugs and money. He refuses to talk, confident that police officers would never hurt him. and reports that officers broke into his home, assaulted him, then stole money and jewelry. The patrolmen know the resident is a local narcotics dealer. They also know there were no drug raids scheduled for that address. Could these home invaders be rogue cops? The incident is part of a wave of excessively violent home invasions plaguing Detroit. Averaging more than one a week, they spread fear throughout the city. The invaders leave no useful evidence behind. In June 1994, the newly formed Safe Streets Violent Crimes Task Force dedicates itself to putting an end to the terror. It is comprised of Detroit police detectives and FBI agents, including Special Agent Michael Kosanovich. We really were determined to solve these violent home invasions. Initially, we were aware of, of approximately 50 home invasion robberies from the beginning of 94 up through June of 94. They were fairly violent. They involved shootings, sexual assaults, Investigators begin by searching for connections between the numerous invasions. Detroit police officer Tom Dunai. We took a look at all the police reports that were taken over the previous two or three months. Uh, we analyzed them, we broke them down into the MOs and exactly what these perpetrators were doing on each one. Investigators identify a recurring method used in the attacks, according to Special Agent Bob Pertuso. The gang used a dynamic approach that law enforcement officers use when they execute a search warrant or make an arrest to gain quick entry into a home and then take control of the occupants. They all wore uh, masks and they were all armed with semi-automatic pistols, assault rifles, MAC-10s. Based on this consistent MO, the task force suspects that a single group is committing most of the invasions. We were able to narrow this down to, yes, it was a gang of about uh, anywhere from four to eight. Uh, the descriptions all fit the same. Uh, their MO was the same. Everything was the same on almost every home invasion. To gather more first-hand information, investigators re-interview the victims of the home invasions. I understand you had some excitement here the other day. They learn that most of them are involved in narcotics trafficking. FBI Special Agent Michael Kosanovich is not surprised that dealers are reluctant to talk. They don't want to reveal the fact that they were selling drugs or conducting illegal activity out of that residence. Detective Sergeant Tom Barry tells the dealers that the task force has no interest in busting them for narcotics. People are getting raped. They're violent. We don't care about the drugs. We need your cooperation. So what's going on? 
about 90% of the time, uh, the drug guy come on board, you come on our team and say, hey, I deal my drugs, I know that's not right, um, I'll tell you what I know about this case. Pose a gun at me and I'm like, he's a cop, you know. Investigators discover that some home invasion victims are not drug dealers. These sometimes elderly people, they're, they're panicking, they're crying, they're begging. Got guns to the side of their head. Where's the dope? Where's the money? Where's the dope? Where's the money? There isn't any money. There isn't any dope. The gang has simply hit the wrong house. Realizing that there are no drugs or money, they turn violent. Did they ask you? We heard all the horrible stories of the torture, 80-year-old women, pistol whipped, hit with the butts of shotguns. FBI Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. What really bothered us the most were the sexual assaults of the uh, females who were present on six of the home invasions. Uh, one in particular, a, a mother and her 15-year-old daughter were raped simultaneously by two members of the home invasion group. Just the look in their eyes, the fear, their anger that was very controlled but yet was all inside their body. You could just feel it with their body emotions. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The little girl, without saying it, just through her eyes, she said, please help us. Please help us. And that hit me. And that look in that girl's eyes will stay with me for the rest of my life. We told her that we would do anything in our power to bring these guys to justice. What I had to do is build their confidence up phone calls every day to let them know that I'm still thinking about them, we didn't forget about anything, and we're on your side and you're well protected and you have nothing to worry about. The fright that was in them will always be there, but they knew they had the full cooperation of the Violent Crime Task Force on their side. Skinny. Concerned that the home invasions are executed like a police raid, the task force confronts the possibility the gang is made up of law enforcement personnel. We checked to see any recent officers that have been fired from the job, uh, maybe were accused of uh, illegal use of narcotics, because this was all revolved around narcotics, you know. So you, you would check, you know, any ex-narcotic officers, and there was nothing. Investigators quickly recognized that the escalating level of violence in these cases indicates that law enforcement is probably not involved. In our experience, police officers aren't going to go that extra step and, and, and fire shots into a house or go rape a victim, uh, things of that nature. It's usually go in and rob, grab, go in and knock the door down, get their uh, whatever they need and run out. Uh, so it'd be, in the beginning, it, we had to look at that, but then we had to eliminate that as the as the uh, more and more as the home invasions were occurring, uh, it got more and more violent. We realized that it wasn't police officers ex or ex police officers. The biggest problem with these subjects acting as police when they committed these home invasions was that they jeopardized legitimate police officers. If a victim has been robbed before by this gang and then the police show up another time to execute a search warrant legitimately, they may start shooting or try to harm the police officers. So what we need to do is start going Now that investigators have a clearer idea of what they are dealing with, they begin their efforts to identify the members of the gang. We looked at a number of people who had committed these offenses in the past, um, or robbery type offenses of narcotics dealers. We contacted various informants and asked them to try and determine the identities of these individuals. However, none of the informants that we had talked to had any specific information regarding the people who were committing these offenses. A couple of hours ago. Over the next month, the home invasions continue, but the task force makes little progress. Every home invasion in the city of Detroit, where people went in posing as officers, we, the Violent Crime Task Force, would respond to it. So we got first-hand information, try to get a feel, are these our guys, are these not our guys, why are they or why are they not? Investigators carefully process each scene, but can find no evidence. Everything we did, we, we weren't getting lucky. We needed a break. July 26, 1994. Nearly two months after the investigation began. <coughs> Detroit.
Detroit police respond to a call about shots fired. They find a barely conscious man with multiple gunshot wounds. He has a gun, police jacket, bulletproof vest, and a ski mask. The clothing matches descriptions of home invaders given by prior victims. Police call for an ambulance. Officers alert the task force. This could be the break they need. Here's a guy, he's got a gun on him, he's got a police vest on. And my only hope at the time was, please don't die. Please don't die. Agents rush to the hospital, hoping the man pulls through. In Detroit, a joint FBI and police task force tackles an epidemic of violent home invasions perpetrated by an elusive gang who uses police-style tactics. Authorities get a break when they find and arrest a critically wounded man who they believe is part of the ring. FBI agents go to the hospital to question the suspect. Fingerprint identification reveals that his name is Dante Garrison. You wake up for a FBI second. Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. He was in pretty bad shape at the time, having been shot three times in the arm, the leg, and the stomach. He said he was aware of some robberies which had occurred, but he didn't want to go into specifics at that time. Special Agent Michael Kosanovich remains hopeful. We were encouraged by the situation, by our analysis of his emotional status, um, and the fact that, that we felt he's, he's probably at some point going to cooperate if we can work this right, if we can talk to him and reason with him. At Detroit Police Headquarters, the task force discusses strategies for persuading Garrison to cooperate. When the suspect's name comes up, Detroit officer Al Page recognizes it. He says he knows his family, and it even once held Garrison when he was a baby. To Detective Sergeant Tom Berry, this is an extraordinary stroke of luck. Now, what are the odds of that? So not only did he get shot and didn't die, we got one of our officers that knows him. This couldn't be any better. Investigators return to the hospital and Officer Page exploits his relationship with the suspect's family, hoping to cajole Garrison into cooperating. The ploy works. Garrison agrees to talk in exchange for immunity from prosecution. He admits that he is, in fact, a member of the home invasion gang and explains that his shooting was the result of an invasion that went terribly wrong. But one of the occupants of the residence had seen them said something and they had fled. They believed that they could come back and successfully commit the home invasion the next night. However, the occupants of that residence were ready and waiting for them. and defend for himself. Special Agent Bob Pertuso. And that was the difference between these criminals and law enforcement. A law enforcement officer would not leave a fellow officer shot in some backyard. <laughs> Knowing Garrison is in poor physical shape, the task force keeps the interview short. They need to keep him healthy. He was eventually moved out of the hospital and allowed to recuperate at home. Once he became capable of, of moving around without any assistance, uh, it was decided that, uh, that we should take him to an off-site location to have him uh, uh, fully debriefed. The 
FBI secretly moves Garrison to a safe house outside of Detroit. Investigators inform him of the potential consequences of cooperating with the task force, according to Detroit police officer Tom Dunai. We let him know that there is a real risk of him losing his life if these guys ever found out that he's talking with authorities about what has occurred. And he wanted protection to make sure nothing would happen to him. And uh, naturally, we gave that protection to him and let him know his name wouldn't be brought up until the day of court. The way it worked was During intensive interviews, Garrison reveals that the gang has several more members than previously suspected. As it turned out, it wasn't the same group of individuals who were committing these home invasions every time. It might be from three to 10 members. And it really depended on who was available when the call went out, who could respond to commit that home invasion that evening. If they were available, they would go. And if, if they needed money, they would go. If they didn't need money, maybe they might stay home that night. He's like, Garrison divulges that two career criminals control the gang. O.B. Carter and Andre Woods. O.B. and Andre Woods directed and determined which targets would be hit and which individuals would go on specific home invasions. Once a residence was targeted for a home invasion, O.B. Carter would page all the gang members that were going to be involved that night. A few of the members would go out and conduct some surveillance on that location. They would try and identify residents, how many, ages. They would return back to the gang, debrief everyone, and then meet again later that night to actually conduct the home invasion. Garrison reveals that Andre Woods actually stages mock-up raids for training purposes. Andre Woods had taken the gang members to vacant houses to practice police-style raids. So that they would be familiar with techniques as far as how to make entry into the residence. They would enter just as the police would enter to secure it. Once the residents are neutralized, the gang interrogates the victims. You make a pay. According to Garrison, Woods is extremely violent. He rapes some of his victims and tortures drug dealers when they won't talk. A lot of times, if the victims would not tell them where the money or the drugs were, they would physically beat them or shoot them until they were willing to provide that information. Garrison describes one home invasion in which the gang tortured an elderly drug dealer. They put the guns to him. Where's the dope? Where's the money? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. They shot him in the leg. And he's in agonizing pain, and they're just hammering him again. And they didn't want to kill him. They wanted him to tell them where the drugs and the money was. Shot him again in the leg and said, hey, I'm Effer. Where's the drugs? We know you got the drugs. We know it's here. Where's it at? Give us, give us, or you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And they shot him again. They told him where it was at. Got their money, got their drugs, and they're on their way. Once a home invasion was complete, they would return to the predetermined location. The money would be divided evenly among the members. Any valuables that someone was able to pick up, it was theirs to keep. Gang member and drug dealer Chris Allen would handle the stolen narcotics. Oh, this is prime weed. It was Chris Allen's responsibility to take those drugs out on the street sell them, get the money for those drugs, and divide it evenly among the members. It is also Alan who would suggest who to target for their home invasions. Alan provided a lot of intelligence to the gang members as far as who would be good people to rob based on his knowledge of their narcotics dealing. He knew that they either would have drugs or money present when the gang went in. Agents are impressed by Garrison's detailed recollection of past crimes. We knew that this was the jewel. He was the break that we needed to make a significant impact on, on all these home invasion robberies. Although Garrison's cooperation is critical to the investigation, it is unlikely that his testimony would stand up in court. 
it would just be his word against theirs, and that would not be sufficient to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that these individuals were guilty of these crimes. We needed admissions from these people, or we needed to catch them in the act of committing a home invasion to be certain that they would be locked up. Authorities must hit the streets and find a way to take down this violent gang. Detroit police and the FBI work to shut down a dangerous home invasion gang. They get a major break when a gang member is found shot and begins cooperating with the investigation. You know where they hang out? What neighborhoods they live in? Nah, man, these... Nah, they wasn't like my boy. A joint FBI police task force begins using the informant's information to identify more gang members, according to Special Agent Martin Vanderfleet. A lot of them had criminal histories that matched up with what was occurring. We felt they were likely involved in this based on that. And we went out and did physical surveillance of their residences and could see that they were associating with other members of the group. Although investigators have received detailed information about the gang's infrastructure from their cooperating witness, the task force needs more evidence to build their case. Authorities show photo lineups of the suspects to the gang's victims, hoping they can identify their attackers. Take your time. Detective Sergeant Tom Berry. The bad thing that we ran into is the victims could not identify them. They were in mask. Everything went by in a flash. They put them down on the floor. Um, they could not identify. Another set. The inability of witnesses to pick out their attackers hurts the case. Take your time. Special Agent Michael Kosanovich. No. We don't have enough information to conduct search warrants to make any arrests. All we have is one individual who's providing information. What we're now looking for is is additional fresh information to allow us to go further in the investigation. The task force asks a federal judge for permission to use wiretaps. If they can prove that there is an ongoing pattern of felonies by the gang, they can take down the entire organization on federal racketeering charges. And apparently he's also one who has trained a few days later, in the early morning hours of September 4th, 1994, police respond to a report of shots fired at an illegal after-hours gambling house. It is owned by Andre Woods, one of the gang's leaders. They interview witnesses and piece together what happened. At 4.30 in the morning, Andre Woods got into an argument with a few of the gamblers. It got out of hand, he didn't like, they disrespected him. Gunned him down, cold blood. Just wiped out, you know, four human lives in, in a second. He just kind of walked out. That's just the way he was. Got in his Mercedes Benz and took off. The task force provides Detroit homicide with information on Woods in his car. Homicide detectives use the information to alert law enforcement nationwide in an all-out effort to find the fugitive. Obviously, this caused us to try and speed up our efforts to obtain these wiretaps because we had had demonstrated to us the propensity for extreme violence. If Woods was willing to commit a quadruple homicide, we felt that they wouldn't be afraid to commit homicides if necessary in the commission of the home invasions. Five days after the quadruple homicide, a judge grants the task force permission to monitor the pagers of several of the gang members. They begin collecting phone numbers and discover a consistent pattern of calls between them. It shows further evidence of the gang's organization. A week later, the unimaginable happens. Fugitive Andre Woods strolls into Detroit police headquarters. Ray walked in and said, hey, I hear you guys are looking for me. Police believe Woods turned himself in because the manhunt was getting too hot. He thought it would be easier to fight the charges in court. 
FBI Special Agent Bob Bertuso is glad to have Woods off the streets. Because he was so violent, he was an enforcer for the gang, and if Woods was still out, there was a great potential for more people to get hurt. A week after Andre Woods surrenders, the task force uses the evidence from the pagers to get its first telephone wiretap on the remaining gang leader, O.B. Carter. We were hoping to be able to identify past home invasions, proceeds of those robbers, and most of all, identify future home invasions so that we could prevent them or catch these individuals in the act. The task force also places Carter under surveillance by a Detroit police crew that includes Officer Steve Miller. Guy was really surveillance conscious, so he was a pretty hard target to follow, but we were able to follow him. The information gathered through surveillance, combined with the evidence from the wiretap, gives investigators further insight into the gang's activities. We were able to start to watch their moves and start to anticipate as opposed to react. Anticipate where they were gonna strike uh, and, and which members were gonna be involved in the next home invasion. Monitoring phone conversations, they learn to recognize gang members' voices and code words. The gang calls their home invasions licks. Detroit police officer Tom Dunai. After we kind of knew that they had just got done with a lick, they all get on the phone and start talking about it and laughing about it and telling them how much money they got out of a certain house or how many guns they got out of a certain house. Then they would talk about narcotics that they got out of the house. From these intercepted details of the crimes, investigators are able to connect the gang to specific home invasions. They weren't very descriptive, but they were descriptive enough where we knew what they were talking about, what they got out of the house. So we were able to match that up with the reports of the, of the victims stating to us what was taken from the house at the time of the home invasion. But it is still not enough. We didn't know specifically which individuals in that group had committed the home invasions. We still needed more information, and we really wanted to catch them in the act of committing a home invasion. One night, a surveillance officer is watching a home where gang members are meeting. Suddenly, an unmarked Detroit police car pulls up. Before surveillance can radio a warning, Four plainclothes officers jump out and head in the direction of the gang house. Dispatch tells surveillance that the four are working on another case, looking for a possible fugitive at the house next door. The officer is worried that the violent gang members don't know it. A Detroit plainclothes arrest team approaches a house, unaware that a vicious gang, armed with automatic weapons, is in the house next door. Yo, 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 fellas, cops! Get ready. Those cops an officer right assigned to surveil the gang watches anxiously, not knowing if the gang will think the officers are coming for them and open fire. After a few tense moments, the officer is relieved to see no indication of a gang response. Later, the joint FBI police task force investigating the gang monitors a wiretap on a gang leader's home. Detroit Police Detective Sergeant Tom Berry learns the gang did in fact know the arrest team was outside. Apparently, they were getting ready to do a home invasion, and a police car pulled up. Home invaders don't know why these cops are out there. They thought they were coming after them. On the wire, what they said is that those cops would have came in here, we would have killed them, just killed them all. That made the hair on our arms stand up. Detroit police officer Tom Dunai is even more determined to get the gang off the streets as soon as possible. We started getting enough evidence on these guys via the wiretap that we decided that before somebody actually gets killed here, we need to, to do something quickly. But investigators need direct evidence of the gang committing a crime to ensure convictions under federal racketeering statutes. 
Special Agent Bob Pertuso. Okay, great. They would be in possession of their weapons. They'd be wearing their bulletproof vests. They'd be in possession of the goods that they stole. To protect innocent bystanders, investigators decide to arrest the gang after they leave a home invasion. Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. We know they're going to be. We did not want to try and arrest them while they were in the house committing a home invasion and possibly risk a hostage situation. But taking down this brutal gang will be extremely dangerous. They had attempted to kill people, rob people, sexually assaulted women. Very violent. In fact, we had developed that information that they had planned to shoot it out with the police when confronted. Very difficult situation. We know they're going to have vests on. We know they're going to have automatic weapons. There was no doubt in our minds that these people, they weren't going to just All throw right. up their hands and give up. They're going to shoot it out. You going with me out here for a minute? Because of the large number of individuals who were involved, as well as the weapons that they were carrying, they were heavily armed with AK-47s, MAC-10s, Uzis, all the dangerous weapons out there in the street. We believe that we needed to use a SWAT team to arrest these individuals. Agents meet with the SWAT commander who lays out the plan. The tactical squad responsible for making the arrests will hide inside an ambulance. With its emergency lights activated, the ambulance will approach the home invader's vehicle from behind as if it were passing. Investigators believe that since the gang will have just committed a home invasion, they will try to remain inconspicuous and pull to the side of the road. And we're going to ram them with the ambulance. The 20 SWAT guys, all dressed in SWAT gear with bulletproof vests, are going to get out and get a half moon around them. So when they start to get out of the car or the van, we've got them contained. We didn't want to get into a chase. That was one of our things we didn't want. Uh, and that's why we decided to ram them, disable their vehicle. Uh, we didn't want to chase. The final component of the plan requires taking down the rest of the organization. We knew from past experience that only certain members of that group would be involved. It wouldn't be the whole group. So we had other police persons ready to make arrests at other locations for whoever was not present during that home invasion, as well as to execute six search warrants. We had hundreds of agents and police officers involved in our plans for the takedown of this group. For weeks, the task force works around the clock monitoring wiretaps, looking for the right opportunity to spring their trap. Then, on November 9th, they hear gang members planning their next home invasion. We intercepted conversations about a plan to do it in two days. We were at a great tactical advantage. We had our federal search warrant signed. We had the assignments to conduct the searches. And of course, the tactical people were, were actually going to handle the arrest. Unfortunately, gang members don't mention where the home invasion will be. We don't know where yet. The next day, Surveillance watches two gang members drive through a neighborhood as though scouting for a potential target. The task force now believes they know approximately where the home invaders will strike. Police headquarters, November 11th. With the home invasion only hours away, the task force goes over the plan with team leaders one final time. Their intent to underscore the danger the officers face, they play a tape recording of the gang's threat to kill police. We played that tape for the people who were going to take these people down later on. This is the real deal. We're not playing with these people. These people aren't playing with you. They have no hesitation of killing a police officer. And you can just see the officers just intently staring. This is real. These guys are going to kill us. At this point, we had been investigating this group for several months, and it was a relatively long-term investigation. And I think most of us on the task force wanted to conclude it, wanted to get them arrested. So we were pretty excited. I think the adrenaline level was pretty high, and we really were expecting that this was going to be the conclusion. Uh, one way or another, we were going to get these people locked up that evening. 
SWAT gives Officer Steve Miller and the rest of the surveillance teams armor-piercing ammunition for their handguns in case the takedown becomes a gunfight. We knew these guys wore the same kind of armor we wore, you know, exact same stuff in there. And we knew that they were shooting armor-piercing rounds out of their weapons. So, you know, we had to try to at least be on level par with them. That evening, surveillance observes the home invaders traveling in two cars. They drive to the area they drove the day before. You know, Everybody's tightening up, tightening up. They drive by the house and they leave. Well, they don't do the robbery. So we're thinking, what the heck's going on? FBI Special Agent Martin Vanderfleet follows the gang from a distance. We didn't want to get too close because we didn't want to risk these individuals seeing police in the area and possibly aborting their raid. The home invaders enter a dark alley and suddenly cut their headlights. They disappear into the darkness, making it impossible to tell whether they parked or continued through the alley. We're not panicking, but where the heck are they at? Where the heck are they at? Police cannot move in for a closer look without potentially blowing their cover. If the home invaders get away, they will be free to commit another heinous crime. The FBI and Detroit police tail a gang of violent home invaders, hoping to catch them in the act. Authorities are anxious to bring closure to a six-month investigation. Here we go. I'll be cool. Yeah, just lay just back cool. here, just lay back cool. here. Just be cool. But when the home invaders cut their headlights, police lose them. Minutes later at the operations center, Detroit Detective Sergeant Tom Berry learns from 911 that the gang has struck again. Home invasion just happened. Six guys in mass dressed as police officers. They robbed the wrong house, got nothing out of it. We got two victims that are both almost 70 years old can't identify. Since the home invaders did not steal anything, investigators decide not to make any arrests. There's simply no evidence to tie the gang to the crime. We can't prove our case. So we sit and we wait. Agents and officers scour the area looking for the home invaders. Detroit police surveillance officer doubles back to the gang's meeting place, thinking they will return there after the invasion. When he arrives, he sees them coming out of the house, dressed in their raid clothes and getting into a van. It appears that the gang is heading out for another robbery. When gang members are dropped off at a house, Miller is right behind them. I ducked into a, a nice little parking space where I could see the front of the house and I could see the van. I adjust my mirrors, you know, get in my surveillance mode. Finally, authorities are in position to actually see the home invaders commit a crime. So the game plan was, they do the robbery, we can't stop it. If we go in, you risk hostages. We don't want hostages, we want nobody to get hurt. Suddenly, Officer Miller notices the home invader's van creeping up behind him. My heart starts pounding, you know, I'm like, this guy saw me. I got my weapon in my hand, you know, and just in case anything happens, you know, I'm, I gotta be ready. By me. The van pulls up to the house. These guys came running out. There's all kind of stuff in their hands, and they all jumped into the van. With a confirmed invasion, the task force puts their arrest plan into motion. Now we're ready to go. Now we're going to take them down. We turn it over to the SWAT team. An ambulance loaded with SWAT personnel approaches the gang's van and attempts to disable the vehicle by ramming it. But at the last 
second, the van speeds up and the ambulance cannot make a strong hit. The van, which has more horsepower, easily gets away from the SWAT team. FBI Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. We obviously had a major problem. We had six highly armed individuals in a van and we had to stop them. Surveillance teams begin pursuing the van, knowing the chase will likely end in a gun battle. FBI Special Agent Bob Pertusa. Whenever you have armed robbers running from the police, wearing bulletproof vests, armed with automatic weapons, once they broke through the attempts by the police to stop them, there was gonna be a confrontation, absolutely. Officer Miller and the other pursuit vehicles continue to chase the van through the streets of Detroit. Suddenly, the van's rear doors open and the gang begins shooting at law enforcement. A SWAT sniper inside one of the chase cars returns fire. At police headquarters, Officer Tom Dunai continues to monitor the chase. It was amazing because of what had happened how controlled the officers were in the street. There wasn't any panic, but people were screaming, shots are being fired. We even heard gunfire over the radio. That's how strong it was. And in my heart, I was scared for the officers at that point. Just stay with them. The chase continues for several miles. Then, inexplicably, the van stops. Four guys bail out the van. They're firing at me, and I jump out of my car, and I fire one shot. I get one shot off of my 9 millimeter, and it jammed. Natural instinct is just, these guys aren't getting away. Let me chase these guys. SWAT officers order the remaining two home invaders to exit the van. But the van takes off, and the chase continues leaving Miller alone to pursue the heavily armed suspects. It was like I could feel the bullet going by. To this day, I can't explain to you why I didn't get shot. And I say, okay, police, we got you surrounded, come out. Miller thought other officers were following behind him. He suddenly realizes He's all alone. And it's like a ghost town. I mean, nobody there. Even worse, he does not know where his attacker has gone. The FBI and Detroit police engage in a running gun battle with a violent home invasion gang. Officer Steve Miller narrowly escapes an ambush. When backup arrives, Miller begins searching for his attacker. We start going up eastbound on Pasadena, just checking, checking. Sure enough, uh, get about five houses up, and uh, this guy is laying face down. So I'm like, you know, okay, get up, you know, get up. And, uh, you know, he wasn't moving, kind of lifeless, so I reached around the field, you know, to see if I could get a pulse from him. He's dead. He's dead. He's later identified as O.B. Carter, the gang's leader. A subsequent autopsy concludes that Officer Miller's first shot, an armor-piercing round, punctured Carter's bulletproof vest and fatally wounded him. Miles away, the police chase comes to an abrupt end when the gang's van breaks down. The two remaining home invaders jump out of the van. One surrenders, but the other will not go down without a fight. FBI agents pursue the fleeing gunman. Searching down a dark alley, Special Agent Bob Pertuso sees a dark shape and carefully approaches. The getaway driver was lying on the ground. He had been uh, uh, shot uh, a number of times. 
the agents call for an ambulance. The getaway driver is taken to a hospital and against all odds, survives. Following a series of fierce gun battles, the task force assesses the casualties. Okay. Hundreds of shots were fired. Incredibly, no one on the arrest team was hit. Our plan worked. Unknown or injured. Did not uh, anticipate the high-speed chase and the violent confrontation, but it happened. It was dealt with uh, effectively. But only three of the six gang members involved in the chase have been apprehended. Detroit police officer Tom Dunai tries to locate them. What I had done was call local hospitals to find out if anybody was admitted with, with a gunshot wound. And we called around a few hospitals. We had a hit at one hospital, and they says, oh, yeah, somebody just came in with multiple gunshot wounds. At the hospital, Dunai confirms the gunshot victim is one of the fugitives. As the search for the remaining two gang members continues, FBI agents, the FBI SWAT team, and local police serve search warrants on six of the gang members' houses. They find critical evidence, according to FBI Special Agent Martin Vandervliet. Well, we found a lot of evidence that had been taken from robberies, including specific items of clothing, of jewelry, and then we also recovered a, a great amount of weapons. Um, a lot of the houses would have three to five guns in them, as well as ammunition, uh, vests, pry bars, masks, and other things. At Detroit Police Headquarters, Detective Sergeant Tom Berry questions the captured members of the home invasion gang. He lets them know they are facing long prison terms and that those who cooperate first may get reduced sentences. Probably 95% of them told us exactly what happened. That's how we were able to identify the rest of the gang, the rest of the peripheral players. Over the following months, the task force systematically arrests gang members. In the end, a total of 29 are convicted and sentenced on federal or state charges in the biggest home invasion prosecution to date. This particular task force, it was the first major task force between the FBI and the Detroit Police Department. We wanted to do a good job for those victims. We made a difference. We really uh, made a difference uh, to the city of Detroit. Uh, we did make it a safer place. Well, it just goes to show you that when, when law enforcement agencies can work together smoothly with the right people, anything can be accomplished. Thanks to the collaborative efforts of the Detroit Police Department and the FBI, the violent home invaders gang is dismantled forever. A ruthless grab for power tears a city apart. A crime family splits in two as the young and the old fight to the death. The FBI is caught in the middle as they infiltrate the syndicate in a desperate attempt to end the brutal war raging on the streets of Philadelphia. In the 1990s, Philadelphia became the scene of a bloody vendetta. The streets erupted in mob warfare. Authorities feared innocent people would be caught in the crossfire. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents launched a complex and risky surveillance operation. Their mission? To bring down a notorious crime family and to stop a brutal turf war before more people were killed. Nineteen ninety. A quiet morning in South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
Joe Andruzzi is being wired by the FBI. He's a 20-year-old accounting student at LaSalle University, and he's in trouble. He's been betting on football through a mafia bookmaker. He was winning at first, but his luck turned sour. He owes the mob $1,000. It's a debt he cannot pay. You understand? I don't think you do so. I don't think you got it at all. I think you understand what's going on here. In way over his head and afraid for his life, Andruzzi contacted the FBI and asked for help. Make money, kid. South Philly is a tough place. Not the kind of place where you want to cross the mob. La Cosa Nostra, the Italian syndicate of organized crime families, runs a profitable and bloody business there. Gambling, loan sharking, and extortion rackets. For years, South Philly was run by Angelo Bruno, known as the Gentle Don because of his dislike of violence. He took over the city in the 1950s. He was brutally murdered in 1980. The man suspected of being behind the hit was Nicodemo Scarfo. Nicky Scarfo took over Bruno's empire. He was a cold-hearted killer who ruled the city by violence. But now Nicky Scarfo is in jail. The FBI wants to find out who is running the Philadelphia mob while the boss is behind bars. Andruzzi's problem with the loan shark gives the FBI the perfect opportunity to collect new information on the organization. The college student meets with the bookmaker. He plays his part perfectly and is introduced to Salvatore Sparaccio, a known member of the Philadelphia Mafia. I don't have money. You don't have the money. FBI Special Agent Jim Marr was the case agent on this investigation. Salvatore Sparaccio didn't make any overt threats, but the implied threat, I'm the boss of the family, you gotta pay. I want $120 a week for 10 weeks. The boss offers a repayment plan. Although the mob is charging little more interest than a credit card company, the penalty for defaulting on the loan has a far higher price. Nicky, here, take some cake off to your wife. Hey, thanks. For the next 10 weeks, the FBI gives Andruzzi the money to make his payments. And each time he takes the money to the bookmaker, the FBI records the conversation building their case against Salvatore Sparaccio. Each payment is evidence of, of the crime, of racketeering. But the FBI is not interested in making low-level gambling arrests. How are we going, huh? They have a much bigger target. I'm sure it's all there. The ultimate goal is to destroy the Philadelphia Cosa Nostra family as a crime problem. Nicky, okay? Hey, Boogie, you know too much. The tactics we use are to attack the hierarchy. The, 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 structure, the, the structure is the, is the target, and we, we attack the target through, through the hierarchy. They need more information. So on Christmas Day, when they know it will be closed, the FBI breaks into the bakery shop. We proved to the judge that gambling activity and loan sharking activity was taking place in an Italian bakery. The judge authorized us to put microphones in. For the next several months, the FBI records the conversations inside the bakery. Sparaccio. We began listening to conversations of Salvatore Sparaccio, who was claiming to be the boss of the Philadelphia Cosa Nostra family. Although Sparaccio claims to be the head of the family, the FBI wire soon makes it clear that Sparaccio is not one of the big Philadelphia Mafia bosses. He is little more than an employee, but the FBI doesn't know who he's working for. Thinking he can lead them to his boss, the FBI surveillance tracks Baraccio to a law office in Camden, New Jersey. 
There he meets with other members of the Philadelphia Mafia, including one man well known to the FBI, John Stanfa. John Stanfa is a Sicilian immigrant and a made member of the Sicilian Mafia. He worked as a driver for the late Angelo Bruno, AKA the Gentle Don, former head of the Philadelphia family. Stanford was implicated in the murder of the former mafia boss in 1981 and was apprehended in Maryland. He was convicted of perjury in his testimony before a grand jury that was probing Bruno's death. He went to jail for eight years. When he was released, the Philadelphia Mafia put out a contract on his life for the killing of Bruno. Special Agent Fred Walsh is a member of the FBI's organized crime squad. Only through the intercession of his Gambino uh, associates up in New York, uh, the contract was taken off him and he was allowed to live. After Nicky Scarfo went to jail, Stanford returned to Philadelphia. He went to work in the construction business and laid low for a while. And he was relatively quiet. So when he started to come to power and we started to notice he was making a name for himself, it came as a kind of a surprise to us. Thanks to the cooperation of the young college student, the FBI has now identified the man they believe is running organized crime in Philadelphia. We had put away the previous boss and most of the hierarchy of the family. We felt if we could put Stanford away, that we would go a long way towards the ultimate goal of, of eliminating the crime, the uh, Philadelphia family as a crime problem. On the street, informants confirm the FBI suspicion that John Stanford is the new boss of the Philadelphia Mafia. Once you determine that an individual like Stanford has taken the family over, you want to see how he intends to run it. You uh, contact your informants, see what they can provide, Stanford maintains a low profile. He runs things like the Gentle Don before him. He engages in traditional mob activities such as loan sharking, gambling, and extortion. The FBI wants to find out where he is conducting business. According to FBI informants, high-level secret mafia meetings are being held in the lawyer's conference room. Informants uh, told us that that's where they were meeting, that they felt secure there. Uh, since it was a lawyer's office, they felt secure there from FBI eavesdropping. We decided that it would be a very, very good place uh, to put microphones. Agents prepare an affidavit to wire the premises. We recognize that intruding into a lawyer's office was extraordinary. The affidavit had to go down to the FBI headquarters. The director of the FBI personally signed off on it. A federal judge gives the FBI the green light. Agents install a hidden video camera outside the law office so they can monitor anyone who enters or leaves the building. How about now? A special FBI entry unit will install a hidden microphone inside the law offices. Agents make a surreptitious entry into the second floor suite. In terms of, uh, of the actual entry into the premises, it's what I regard to be one of the most dangerous things the FBI does because you're, you're, you're burglarizing someone else's property. Although you have authority to be there, the person, if you, if you encounter someone, he doesn't know that you have authority to be there. Inside, the agents fear they've been discovered. An armed deputy sheriff is inside the building. The night before we went in, the uh, re-elect the sheriff campaign moved into the ground floor. The agents making the entry were surprised by a deputy sheriff. Fortunately, uh, they were able to conceal themselves. He got in and got out before there was any problem. technicians install a microphone in the conference room. 
The surveillance agents will first try to identify each suspect and determine their roles in the organization. There's 18 FBI agents who do nothing but physical and photographic and video surveillances. Most of their work they did for the organized crime squad. So we've got a lot of manpower out there, and we've got people who, who know how La Cosa Nostra works. And we can a lot of times figure out a hierarchy just by watching the way that they behave towards one another. That coupled with information coming from informants can tell us who the hierarchy is. Agents monitoring the conversations have to match the voice on the wire to the face in the video surveillance. John Stanford was very easy. He had a very heavy Italian accent. Uh, so it was very easy to figure out uh, when he was speaking. But the agents have a problem. The conversations we intercepted in the office indicated to us that they were uh, leaving the conference room and going somewhere. After going to all the trouble to plant the wire, the mob boss moves the meetings. The surveillance agents will have to find out where the meetings are now taking place. They will have to place another bug. They're gone. They're, they're somewhere else. A few days later, the FBI learns from an informant that a high-level sit-down is about to take place at the law office between John Stanfa and several associates. They need to get the new bug in place before the meeting. But they don't know where the meeting will be held. Agents dispatch an undercover detective to follow Stanfa into the office. Philadelphia detective Mark Panero gets the job. We try to come up with a reason to actually go into the law firm to get a, a closer look at what was going on. So we had come up with a cover story uh, utilizing a, a name of an attorney that we knew had left that firm. But it does not go exactly as planned. This uh, unknown individual held the door for me to go in first, which kind of uh, set me back because I wanted to go in second. I wanted to see where they, they were going before I was attended to. But I was relieved when I walked in and the receptionist greeted John Stanfa, and John Stanfa told her, let him know I'm here. And uh, the receptionist immediately keyed her uh, intercom and let the lead attorney of this law firm know that John was there and to send him in. So not only was I able to get her to identify John Stanfa, I was able to stand there and watch him go down to the actual office of this lead attorney at uh, this law firm. That's good. It's real good. Okay, lock it on. Thanks. With this information, a federal court approves an affidavit for a second break-in at the office. Agents install hidden microphones in the attorney's office. Shortly after the new bugs are placed, agents hear some alarming news on the wire. The mob bosses are afraid they are being watched. They hire a private counter-surveillance contractor to sweep the law offices for bugs. If he finds a listening device, the entire operation could be destroyed. The FBI in Philadelphia is closing in on mob boss John Stanfa. They learn he is conducting mob business in an attorney's office. Agents place listening devices in the office But Stanford calls in a man to sweep for bugs. Agents watch as the sweeper enters the building. Their entire case could collapse if he finds their bugs. Here they come. What's going on here? But after a few tense minutes, the private contractor completes his sweep without finding anything. It sort of brought a smile to everybody's face because uh, they basically brought in an expert who didn't detect anything. So that would bring a sort of a feeling of ease on their part. And uh, I guess our expectations were that they would be even more at ease to discuss further criminal activity. 
Now with microphones in the conference room and the lawyer's private office, the information begins to come in. The FBI learns that John Stanford is having problems with a group of young mobsters. Born and raised in South Philly, their allegiance is still with Nicky Scarfo and the Mafia regime before Stanford took over. They are known as the Young Turks. As far as they're concerned, Philadelphia is and always has been their turf. And the Young Turks deserve to be running the crime family, not newcomer John Stanfa. I always do the best job. Joey Merlino is the boss of the Young Turks. Michael Changlini is the number two man. Joey and Michael have known each other since grade school. FBI Special Agent Gary Langan is the co-case agent. They didn't like the fact that John Stanford, who they considered an outsider, would come in and take over the mob family. And so they were trying to organize their own little group, even though they were part of the overall picture. And they wanted to be in charge. Informants tell the FBI that the Young Turks are not taking orders from John Stanford. They bragged about the, who they were and who they were aligned with. Bragged about how they were going to take the city over. They were the legitimate successors to the previous mob members under Nicky Scarfa. They were going out and shaking down um, bookmakers, drug dealers, uh, and even in shaking down legitimate businesses and uh, weren't sharing the profits, to, you know, kicking upstairs to stand for. The Young Turks feel they're entitled to run the city and the Philadelphia Mafia. The aging John Stanfa, the old world Sicilian boss, resents the ostentatious lifestyle of the Young Turks. The Young Turks, if you will, were very, very uh, flamboyant. They'd go into the clubs on Delaware Avenue, throw their weight around, push people around, uh, trade on the fact that they were connected to the local Cosa Nostra family, and in general call attention to themselves, uh, which is not a good thing. If you're running a Cosa Nostra family, you should be located Hey, 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 girls, get in the car. Jake, come on, get out of here. Start it up, start it up. The Young Turk boss, Joey Merlino, has a different idea of how a Cosa Nostra boss should live the life. He was the kind of guy who felt that when he went into a restaurant, because of who he was, he shouldn't have to pay. Uh, this was easily adopted by his entourage, and they became a problem for everybody. There, there, was, there were fights, there were shootings, there were... It's just not the way to run a Cosa Nostra family. Uh, attracting all that attention to yourself. Uh, the police begin to know then where you are and uh, who you are, and it's just not a good thing. John Stanford was particularly angered by the Young Turks' involvement in the sale of illegal narcotics. That was the wave of the future, and it's an easy way to make money. Um, traditionally, the mob... Uh, frowns upon uh, having its members engage in drug dealing. Now, that, that's not to say that they, they don't do it. They get around that by uh, having an associate or something uh, deal drugs, and then they'll tax that individual and take a percentage of it. But Stanford, you know, he thought drugs were a dirty business, and it draws a lot of attention, again, to the family. And uh, he didn't want to do that. And these guys were just uh, defying him and doing it. Once we heard that there was friction developing, we were looking to see how Stanford was going to handle it. Okay, was he going to be aggressive and, uh, you know, take extreme measures? Or was he going to try and uh, mollify these people and uh, quiet them down and get them under his uh, uh, wing, so to speak? But Joey Merlino isn't going under anyone's wing. The Young Turks strike back at Stanford. 73-year-old Joseph Gatone is one of Mafia boss John Stanford's most loyal employees. Gatone is a bookmaker, a collector of street taxes. Four gunshots shatter the daily routine of Joseph Gatone. 
the old man's blood marks the beginning of a deadly civil war. The FBI and the Philadelphia Organized Crime Task Force surveilled top bosses of the Philadelphia Mafia. Friction between feuding factions of the crime family increase, and a bloody civil war breaks out. Philadelphia police officers arrive at the scene of the shooting. The victim's keys are still in the ignition, and the engine is still running. Two bullets penetrated the victim's neck. A third bullet entered his temple. A fourth grazed the bridge of his nose and shattered the passenger side window. When Agent Marr arrives on the scene, police have already checked the registration of the car, but they don't yet know who the victim is. Agent Marr recognizes the victim from previous investigations. Gatone is a longtime member of the Philadelphia crime family, currently under the leadership of John Stanfa. Several of Gatone's neighbors witnessed the shooting, but no one can identify the lone hooded gunman. Special Agent Jim Marr suspects Joey Merlino's young Turks are behind the killing. Where he was killed, the manner in which he was killed, indicated to me that the Merlino faction was sending a message to Stanfa and his people, we're here and we are to be reckoned with. John does. Agents monitor their wiretaps. But no one is talking about the murder. Special Agent Fred Walls. Initially at the time that uh, this bookmaker was murdered, uh, we weren't sure who was involved. There was nothing definitive on the uh, wire after the bookmaker had been murdered. There was a reference to the fact, but nothing that would indicate to us that Stanford had a belief someone had done it or someone hadn't done it. Investigators are certain the murder is mob-related, but they have no proof. When they speak to Stanford himself, he claims to know nothing. But Stanford strikes back. Five weeks after the murder of John Stanford's bookie and tax collector, Michael Changlini, the Young Turks' number two man, is coming home after a basketball game. Two men armed with shotguns open fire. Somehow, Changlini, his wife and two children, were uninjured in the attack. Investigators recover 12-gauge shotgun shells from the front yard and shotgun pellets from the ceiling of the living room and dining room. Despite the brazen attack on Changlini and his family, he won't cooperate with the detectives. Uh, he wasn't going to say anything. They just don't talk to law enforcement. They, they feel they're going to handle it themselves. It's business, okay, it's, and it's none of our business. So you're not going to get anything out of them. The Young Turks' number two boss isn't talking. But the FBI suspects the attack is payback for the murder of John Stanford's bookie. After the bookmaker's uh, murder and then the attempt on Michael Cinglini, we believed that we were going to see uh, an increase in violence. There was going to be a potential mob war. Fearing this, the FBI petitions a federal court to expand the eavesdropping. In the spring of 1992, they get the court order they need. Agents place bugs in seven new locations, including lawyers' private offices, the law library, the television room, and the lunchroom. The new wires immediately start paying off. Early in May of 1992, FBI cameras catch Stanford arriving at the law office with his consigliere and Joseph Changlini, brother of the Young Turk second in command. Inside, John Stanford angrily announces that he knows the Young Turks are looking for him. They want him dead. But Stanford doesn't want a war. He wants to make one last attempt at diplomacy. His first move is to make Joseph Changlini 
his new underboss. I guess he thought, as a concession to them, he would be able to control them. There's a saying, uh, keep your friends close, keep your enemies even closer. This was the way to keep uh, an eye on them. But we fully anticipated that we were going to see an increase in violence, but uh, we were surprised by what did happen. Informants tell the FBI that Stanford invites Joseph Changlini's younger brother, Michael, and the young Turk boss, Joey Merlino, to a secret meeting. Here, Joey and Michael become made members of La Cosa Nostra. You have to swear to uh, place the family before anything else in your life. God, your, per you know, your, your own personal family, your mother, your father, your wife, your children, if the family calls you, you come before them. Now, as made members of La Cosa Nostra, the two young Turks enjoy special privileges. The benefits that come with that are that uh, you can conduct your rackets, whatever they may be, without fear of interference from someone who is not a member. The family in a dispute will always decide in your favor if you are a member and the other person is not. A member cannot be killed unless the boss of that family to which he's a member approves. For John Stanford, promoting the Young Turks is his final act of diplomacy. The FBI and the Organized Crime Task Force will keep a vigilant watch to see if Stanford's bold move stops the violence. But agents still need to collect more information about the crime family to shut them down for good. Through an informant, they learn the law office is not the only place where Stanford and his associates are congregating. We found out that uh, Stanfa had opened up a dinette next to another business he owned, which was a food uh, distribution business. And surprisingly, uh, Stanfa actually worked at this place every day. You know, as a John Q. citizen, he would go to work and he actually worked there. You'd see him out there sweeping and uh, cooking and handling stuff. But he was also meeting his uh, family members there and discussing mob business. So the next step, logically, is to attempt to get a Title III bug installed in the dinette so that we can listen to the conversations he's having with uh, these uh, members and uh, associates of the family. Once the microphone is installed inside the dinette, the FBI hears that an angry John Stanford is still having problems with the Young Turks. He requests a final sit-down with Joey Merlino. Joey Merlino and Michael Changlini pay a visit to Stanford. Gamblers are complaining that the young Turks are not honoring their bets. Merlino assures the boss he'll fix the problem and make good on the debts. The meeting ends amicably. Perhaps there can be peace within the family. Early in March, FBI surveillance agents observed Joseph Changlini and a waitress opening up the Stanford dinette. It's almost exactly one year after his brother Michael was nearly gunned down at his home. His activities were easy to document. Uh, he was regular. He, uh, he got up in the morning and he went to work. But on this morning, Joseph Changlini's routine takes a terrifying twist. Four men pull up and open fire on Changlini and the waitress, reigniting the bloody war between the old and the new mafia of South Philadelphia. On March 2nd, 1993, in South Philly, underboss Joseph Changlini and a waitress opened John Stanford's diner. Shortly after 6.30 a.m., 
Four gunmen launch an attack. Changlini is gunned down. The surveillance agent alerts FBI HQ and calls 911 for an ambulance. The FBI agent on surveillance arrives on the scene. Joseph Changlini has been shot repeatedly in the head, neck, and chest. The waitress is unharmed. Changlini has somehow managed to survive the deadly attack. Though severely wounded, he can talk. You couldn't get a statement out of him, and even if he knew who did it, he, he wasn't going to implicate anybody. He was, he was part of the mob, the Omerta, the Code of Silence, and, and uh, they would take care of this on their own. They had to know who they were. He saw them. Uh, we suspected that it was a group from the Young Turks, and, but he basically told us he didn't know anything. Hoping to identify the shooters, FBI agents review the surveillance tapes. But in the early morning darkness, the images are too dark to identify anyone. The uh, video was very grainy, very blurry. It was very hard to uh, identify with any kind of particularity. Uh, features where you would recognize who actually went in, but you couldn't see four shapes going in. Then you, you go to the uh, audio and you hear uh, screaming, and you hear shots, and then you hear uh, someone yelling, move, move, and then they exit the place and they drive away. Well, that's basically all we had. But you couldn't say with any reasonable certainty who actually went in there and shot okay. Joseph Cinglini. But agents are still surveilling the law office. In the listening post, wiretaps record a chilling conversation between Stanfa and a mob associate. John Stanfa suspects Michael Changlini was behind the attempt to kill his own brother, Joseph, at the restaurant. Yeah, Michael and Joey were on the uh, opposite sides of internal war within the Stanfa family. They were half-brothers, and it didn't make any difference. He wanted to, he thought his brother, Joey, was on the wrong side. And, He's going to take him out. For John Stanfa, there is only one choice. Eliminate Joey Merlino and the Young Turks. So he starts to recruit uh, his own muscle to send them out and to start stalking these Young Turks and trying to uh, kill Joey Merlino, Michael Cinglini, and the people associated with him. Undercover FBI agents deliver a warning to Merlino and Michael Cinglini. What's going on, fellas? When we're aware of the fact that uh, uh, violence is going to occur or may occur, and we think we know who the violence is going to uh, occur against, we have an obligation to go out and warn them. John Stanfa is sending hit teams into the streets with orders to gun down Merlino and Cinglini. The Young Turks shrug off the FBI warning. Even though they know their lives are in danger, they refuse to cooperate. The Young Turks should have listened to the FBI. A Stanford hit team tracks them down and opens fire in broad daylight. Michael Changlini is shot in the heart and dies on the street. Joey Merlino is wounded. It is clear to the FBI that John Stanford means business. He's uh, taken up the uh, challenge and he's retaliated with a lot of force. So that's where we are right then and there. We believe that Stanford is responsible for it. Now we have to prove it. Three hours after the shooting, South Philadelphia police officers respond to a burning vehicle. The car matches the description of one seen by witnesses at the shooting. Police run a trace and learn that it was leased to a member of the Stanford crime family. That night, police questioned Phil Coletti and his wife. She tells police she reported the car stolen. Coletti says he has been home all day. 
The FBI views the couple's alibi with skepticism. Coletti becomes the first suspect in the shooting murder of Michael Changlini. Several days later, the FBI gets a lead on the second shooter. The, the FBI received a call from a, a, a physician who said that he had treated an individual who came in with burns. That he felt were rather suspicious. FBI agents find John Vesey at home. He, too, is a known member of the Stanford crime family. Agents ask Vesey what happened to his hand. And he says he had an accident with his barbecue grill. His hand was burned when he spilled lighter fluid. Vesey insists the burn was an accident and says he knows nothing about the murder of Michael Changlini and the shooting of Joey Merlino. But when investigators check out the grill, they discover it runs on propane, which conflicts with Vesey's story that he was using lighter fluid when he burned himself. It aroused our suspicion and kind of uh, pointed us toward Vesey more so than anybody else. The FBI suspects two members of the John Stanford crime family in the murder of Michael Changlini and the shooting of young Turk boss Joey Merlino. But before the FBI can bring the shooters to justice, Joey Merlino and the young Turks try to get their own revenge. John Stanford is riding in a 1976 Cadillac Seville. He's headed south on the Schuylkill Expressway with his son Joseph and a trusted driver. A van pulls up next to the Cadillac. Two gunmen thrust 9mm machine pistols through portholes cut in the side of the van, and they open fire. A full-scale mafia civil war rages on the streets of Philadelphia. Violence explodes with a brazen rush hour attack on Sicilian mob boss John Stanfa. The gunfire misses John Stanfa, but his son Joseph is hit in the face. Stanford's driver rams the van, forcing it off the highway. What was really brazen about it was on a highway like that, random shots could have struck and hurt, even killed any, any innocent people who were on there. Investigators have no doubt the attack on Stanford is Joey Merlino's revenge for the murder of Michael Changlini. It showed you the extent of the uh, violence these people were willing to employ and uh, the grudge they bore against uh, Stanford. Police find Stanford at the hospital. Despite the brazen attack on him and his innocent young son, the Cosa Nostra boss claims he has no idea who tried to kill them. And of course, it's the old, I don't know who would have done this to me. And we don't get anything out of him. It is only a matter of time before innocent civilians get caught in the crossfire. And it's time to turn up the heat on the warring mob. Any known Stanford or Merlino associate seen driving around South Philadelphia becomes the subject of a routine traffic stop. Authorities arrest eight mobsters for carrying weapons. They confiscate 380, 45, and 38 caliber semi automatics. The FBI has no doubt the Young Turks boss ordered the hit on John Stanford but feds can't prove it. Joey Merlino has to be yanked off the streets. The FBI arrests him for a parole violation of a 1990 armored truck robbery. With Joey Merlino off the streets, it is now time for the FBI to focus its sights on John Stanford's crew. The agents target murder suspect John Vesey. The professional hitman is one of John Stanford's soldiers. But tonight, thanks to a New Jersey firearms violation and the threat of a long jail sentence, Vesey has agreed to wear a wire for the FBI. He was a very tough, tough individual. And he did some construction work as a hired laborer for uh, 
John Stanford's brother-in-law, who was in construction. And he caught the eye of Stanford, and Stanford and, uh, realized this kid was a tough kid, and he could, you know, he, he intimidated people. Under Stanford, V.C. became a loan collector, an enforcer, and a killer. Okay. Now he claims he feels the weight of the murders he committed. All these things, plus the fact that his brother, uh, who really cared for him, was convinced that uh, John was going to go down and never see the light of day. His brother convinced him that he should cooperate. Vesey was made into the family by John Stanfa. And now he wants to get out, alive. You couldn't measure the significance of it. It was, uh, uh, it was like a coup for us that he came on board. V.C. quickly becomes comfortable wearing the wire. He has several meetings, but the conversations don't provide any new evidence against John Stanfa. He's out for a little while. He, I think he met with one or two people, nothing great. He was a little... He was a little down about the fact that he wasn't getting the conversations, you know, he wanted to. He was really into it. We told him, look, don't worry about it. You know, we got a lot of time. We'll do it again till we get it right, you know. It's Friday night now. You know, you've worked long and hard for us. Go home. Go home and uh, relax. Don't go out. We'll hook up with you again. We'll do it again. Later that night, John Vesey runs out of luck, and the FBI's organized crime task force is dealt a crippling blow. In a bloody South Philadelphia mob war, the FBI's number one informant is gunned down by mafia hitmen, and the FBI's best chance at busting up a notorious crime family is shattered. FBI Special Agent Fred Walls is devastated by the news that informant John Vesey has been shot. Well, when you hear that someone's been shot in the head, you think the worst. But against all odds, after three 22 caliber slugs slammed into his skull, John Vesey is still alive. I'm shocked. This guy was shot in the head. He's given an interview. And he proceeds to tell what happened. Earlier that night, after he removed the wire and the FBI agents went home, Vesey ran into John Stanford's underboss and one of his soldiers. I know a nice place. And they tell him, we've been looking for you. We want to uh, get you started in your own bookmaking operation. We're going to show you how to do it. We're going to go over to this location in South Philadelphia above this meat store. For Vesey, it was just another late-night business meeting. He wasn't wearing the wire anymore, and he thought he had nothing to fear. He says he goes up to the room. The main guy is sitting down with him at a table, going over figures, telling him how to take bets, how to write stuff down. The underboss excuses himself. He has to go to the bathroom. John Vesey heard the sound of the flushing toilet and the door to the bathroom opening. And then he heard the gunshots. Three 22 caliber slugs impacted John Vesey's skull, but he didn't go down. Vesey turns around, looks at the guy, and says, what the frig are you doing? And of course, the, the shooter now, he's, he's in shock. So he throws the gun down, and he pulls out a knife. Well, Vesey takes the knife away from him and cuts him and basically incapacitates him and throws him on the ground. He turns to the uh, other guy, the main guy, who's an older guy, and the guy looks at him and he says, John, John, he said, this has all been a mis mistake. It's a, a misunderstanding. We're gentlemen here. We can settle this. And Vesey says, get out of the way or I'm going to take you down too. And against all odds, John Vesey walks out of the room alive. That just goes to show you how tough this kid was. I mean, he was tough. And uh, the bullets went into the back of his head, and uh, we later found out they had hit the head and come around, okay? I guess the slugs weren't as strong. It was a 22 caliber, cal 22 caliber long rifle slug. 
and he took three in the head and survived. Two weeks later, ex-mafia hitman John Vesey makes his first appearance before the federal grand jury and testifies against his former crime family. The information he provides is invaluable to the FBI. Vesey names names and gives the FBI what they need to move against the Philadelphia mob. When the FBI increases the pressure, other mobsters make deals with the prosecutors and become informants for the FBI. And the dominoes begin to fall. On St. Patrick's Day in 1994, 24 suspects are arrested on racketeering charges of murder, murder conspiracy, extortion, arson, kidnapping, gambling, and obstruction of justice. Among those arrested is Frank Martinez. He's found guilty of assault and the attempted murder of John Vesey. Vincent Pagano is also arrested and found guilty of assault and the attempted murder of John Vesey. On the same day, John Stanford is arrested on racketeering charges of murder, murder conspiracy, extortion, arson, kidnapping, gambling, and obstruction of justice. It was a, a nice, clean, easy sweep. We brought the people in, and uh, we were very satisfied with it. Ultimately, 27 people are charged with conspiracy and racketeering under the RICO Act. 24 defendants are either convicted or plead guilty to the charges. I felt pretty good that we did make Philadelphia a little bit safer. Uh, it's, it was my job. Uh, it was my life's work. Um, I thought we did a good job, and I thought the, 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 that we served the citizenry very well with what we did. We took a, a very, very violent group uh, and sent a lot of them to jail for a long, long time. And we made Philadelphia a little safer. On July 9th, 1996, John Stanford is sentenced to five consecutive life terms. He is serving them at the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas.